What do you think a just world looks like? For me, it's a world where each and every individual is treated with respect, dignity, and fairness, regardless of their race, gender, ability, sexuality, ethnicity, or other aspects of their identity. A just world, to me, is a world free of discrimination, exploitation, and domination in all its forms. A world with equal access to the necessities of a good life, and a world where the harm people may perpetuate will be addressed with consideration for the needs of victim, perpetrator, and community alike. Perhaps this just world is unattainable. Perhaps the subjectivity of justice bars the possibility of a justice system that makes everyone happy. We may never agree on what justice would look like in every situation, but that doesn't mean we can't strive for better every day, right? The widespread injustice present in our world today, where people suffer and struggle for their whole lives due to lack in an age of abundance, need not be so. In the vast majority of cases, our current justice systems keep the powerful unaccountable and the powerless perpetually punished. So today, we put justice on trial in order to explore how we define crime, how our responses to crime fall short, and what alternatives may exist for a more just world. Crime could be defined as any act prohibited by the laws of the state, or any omission of an act mandated by the state, where this act or omission is subject to punishment by the state. This isn't some fringe anarchist definition, mind you. All crimes are crimes against the state. Whether you steal a loaf of bread, light a spliff, pirate a video game, box a bad john, or break into an abandoned building, the state is going to take that personally. The practice of policing results primarily in violence, incarceration, and death. Whether property crimes, drug crimes, cyber crimes, or violent crimes, the state assumes responsibility for dealing with the offense from arrest to trial to sentencing, regardless of the actual impact of the act or omission or the will of those involved. The criminal justice system perpetuates trauma for both victims and perpetrators and maintains the marginalization of the lower classes and of ethnic minorities. Those incarcerated are pressured to conform to the prevailing ethical standards of their surroundings, while the communities they leave behind can suffer gravely from their absence. Rather than function as a means of rehabilitating and reintegrating those who have caused harm, prisons tend to amplify antisocial behavior in those who are incarcerated and pressure them down a path of recidivism. By creating a separate criminal class, The state isolates certain people from the rest of society, allowing them to sow fear and division among the masses, and helping to distract the public from the underlying causes and conditions of social ills. One of the primary purposes of the state is to protect private property, which enables capitalism to flourish, but also leads to social fragmentation, relative deprivation, and poverty as the working class lacks access to the means of subsistence or production. How does the saying go? Steal a loaf of bread and they'll hang you. Steal the land and they'll make you king. Though the causes of crime are complex and multifaceted, much of the criminal activity that the state claims to punish arises from the very conditions that it aims to maintain, from the very laws it exists to uphold. For example, The crime of squatting is the direct result of the institution of private property in closing the commons, upholding settler colonization, and commodifying housing, all which the state continues to defend. It's no surprise, then, that people have been criticizing the capitalist causes of crime and its punitive response for centuries. In the debates between French philosopher Baron Louis Armand Lahontan and Wendat chief Condé Aronc in the 17th century, Condé Aronc dissects the feelings of the French legal system and details his observations that the whole apparatus of trying to force people to behave well would be unnecessary if France did not also maintain a contrary apparatus that encourages people to behave badly, an apparatus consisting of money, private property, and the resultant pursuit of material self-interest. Quote, I have spent six years reflecting on the state of European society, and I still can't think of a single way they act that's not inhuman, 
And I genuinely think this can only be the case as long as you stick to your distinctions of mine and thine. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils, the tyrant of the French, the source of all evils, the bane of souls and slaughterhouse of the living. To imagine one can live in a country of money and preserve one's soul is like imagining one could preserve one's life at the bottom of a lake. Money is the father of luxury, lasciviousness, intrigues, trickery, lies, betrayal, insincerity of all the world's worst behaviour. Now, I wouldn't deny that self-interest plays a major role in our day-to-day decision-making, and it will likely still have a place in a post-capitalist world. But it is not the only factor at play, and furthermore, its worst manifestations do not need to be so structurally incentivized. It's clear to me that a truly just justice system cannot be compatible with the conditions present under capitalism and the state. When the people we need the most protection from are the ones at the helm of this system of violence and deprivation, we cannot rely on them to address or prevent the crimes they themselves define and perpetuate. As long as the root causes of these issues persist under this system, it will be impossible for us to achieve some form of genuine justice. To achieve genuine justice, we must first challenge our understanding of what constitutes crime and reevaluate our responses to it. There will never be a single, all-encompassing solution to this complex issue. Nevertheless, we can observe the shortcomings of our current approach and acknowledge that policing and incarceration have failed to address these problems effectively. The cycle of violence that plagues our communities will not be resolved through more state-sanctioned violence. First and foremost, we need to be using more precise language. So let's start by defining the difference between transgression, violence, domination, and abuse of power. A transgression refers to a breach of social norms. What is considered acceptable or unacceptable behavior varies based on cultural and social context and is thus subject to change. In some places, you can't even hug in public, while in others, kissing is normal. Littering is also a transgression in most places, as is using excessive profanity. Stealing from people is also considered a transgression, as is breaking a red light. Many transgressions are criminalized or penalized in some capacity, but that doesn't mean that they would no longer be transgressions if they weren't criminalized or penalized, nor does it mean that criminalization or penalization is always the most effective way of responding to those transgressions. Not to mention, transgressions do always signify problematic conduct, you know. They may instead indicate necessary resistance to problematic standards. Historically, interracial relationships were highly transgressive, but human love need not be bound by the fictional barriers of race. And in some places today, short shorts are transgressive, but sometimes you had to let the dogs breathe. Violence is defined as the use of physical force so as to injure, abuse, damage, or destroy. Violence may be immediate, as with hate crimes, physical assault, and rape, and violence may be gradual, as with neglect, systemic discrimination, and environmental degradation. Nearly all forms of immediate violence are criminalized. Whether it is violence that a person inflicts upon themselves, violence inflicted by another individual or group of individuals, or violence inflicted upon property. Gradual violence is often overlooked, and because the state determines what it classifies as crimes, the violence the state inflicts and the violence inflicted by the systems the state supports are rarely criminalized, or even penalized. The violence used to dominate is often ignored. The violence used to liberate is often demonized. This brings us to domination. Domination is more than just exerting power over others. It is an ongoing hierarchical relationship of control, whether on an individual or systemic level. Patriarchy, for example, employs sexual and domestic violence to reinforce male control over women. In this context, isolated cases of sexual and domestic violence against women contribute to the systemic domination of patriarchy. Yes, women are also capable of assaulting men, but such cases do not reinforce a larger social structure. Not all harmful behavior or abuses of power can fit neatly into any specific category of structural domination, but that doesn't make them any less harmful to their victims. 
For instance, robberies are usually conducted by people who lack access to structural power. A group of guys sees an opportunity to thief a car and are necessarily part of some system of GTAocracy, but they can use their superior strength, size, weaponry, or numbers to assert temporary power over their victims. That's what I mean by abuses of power. Instead of focusing on how we can fix crime, a vague notion that simply refers to violations against the state, we should instead shift our focus towards finding the most effective ways to address abuses of power, domination, harmful transgressions, and the ways in which such acts and relationships restrict all of our autonomy and well-being. So, how do we do that? We should start with prevention, which, as they say, is better than the cure. Poverty, relative deprivation, adverse childhood experiences, familial dysfunction, lack of education, opportunity or support, substance abuse, and even biological imbalances all contribute to the abuses of power and harmful transgressions typically classified as crimes. I believe that by undertaking the process of social revolution, which should involve restoring the commons, developing cooperative models of child rearing, breaking down prejudices and stigmas, targeting the manifestations of patriarchy and white supremacy, establishing new systems of democratic participation, and empowering people through control over their own labor and education, we can significantly reduce or even eradicate many of the so-called crimes of our time. However, it is naive to assume that no one will ever cause harm to others just because we've begun developing a more socially and economically just world. Despite our aspirations, people are still capable of succumbing to their worst impulses. Some individuals may still be compelled to exert their power over others through violence or the threat of violence. So there's still room for individual responsibility, even while acknowledging the significant influence of socialization into systems of domination and exploitation. We need to develop a flexible justice system, equipped with a range of responsive and proactive tools in order to counteract instances of abuse of power and resolve conflicts between people. Such a system would no doubt entail avenues of mediation and arbitration. Mediation is a conflict resolution approach that is willingly adopted by both parties, whether individuals or groups. They choose to present their dispute to a mediator, who does not have a personal stake in the outcome, not to make a decision for them, but to aid them in reaching their own decision. This approach is particularly useful in cases where there is no clear-cut distinction between the perpetrator and the victim. The mediation process can involve a support person for each side of the dispute, in addition to a skilled mediator who is proficient in de-escalation and promoting dialogue and understanding between the parties. The mediator's aim is not to assign blame, but to reconcile and facilitate solutions. However, mediation has its flaws. When emotions run too high, it can be difficult to find any common ground. The ideal of impartiality is not always a complete guarantee. Differences in personality, such as introversion and extroversion, can have an outsized impact on the outcome of the mediation. Not to mention, mediation can sometimes be misapplied to abusive relationships and manipulated by the abusive party in order to reinforce unequal power dynamics. Mediation has its place in resolving conflict within communities, but I think it demands a degree of social solidarity that we currently lack. Today we live in mass societies of disconnected millions. We have simplex relationships with many of the people we interact with, meaning there is one social relationship between the parties, such as neighbours. However, I believe that mediation requires a greater degree of multiplex relationships, in which multiple levels of social connection exist between the parties, such as a friend who is also a neighbour, colleague, and a fellow member of a football club. Within a network of multiplex relationships, individuals may be able to wield an unsung tool of collective action, the social boycott, against people they may typically be powerless to defend themselves against. While boycotts require sacrifice and often do not benefit individuals directly, they can create significant leverage through transitive action in which people that support the targeted behavior or action are also targeted. While multiplex relationships may create more potential and greater ramifications for conflict, 
they also provide greater incentives for peaceful resolution. This is where I believe arbitration may provide a more viable alternative, as it works well for disputes between strangers. Unlike with mediation, the third party makes the final decision on the dispute for the parties, rather than simply helping the parties reach their own resolution. Arbitration cases may involve a single trained arbitrator, a group of arbitrators, or a communal jury. The primary responsibility of the arbitrators is to review the facts of the case, the surrounding circumstances, and the statements made by both parties to arrive at a resolution of the conflict. In addition to its role in conflict resolution, arbitration can also be employed in a facilitative capacity, such as in the creation of agreements between individuals, cooperatives, or popular assemblies. Mediation and arbitration, though primarily mediation, play a pivotal role in restorative justice, an alternative to the punitive approach that focuses on the needs of the victim, the offender, and the community affected and emphasizes recognizing and repairing harms, healing processes between victims and offenders, reconciliation, accountability, and reintegration rather than punishment. Restorative justice processes often involve face-to-face meetings or mediation sessions between the offender and the victim, as well as community members. Restorative justice recognizes that addressing the complex issue that is crime requires a holistic approach that considers the needs and perspectives of all parties involved rather than simply punishing offenders and ignoring the needs of victims and communities. However, like every other alternative, restorative justice is not without its shortcomings. For one, it can be highly dependent on the willingness of the parties involved to engage in the process, which means if offenders aren't willing, or victims aren't willing, the process can happen. There's also a risk of re-victimization, as face-to-face meetings may be traumatizing for the victim, particularly in cases of physical violence. Restorative justice can be weaponized by those who wish to maintain social peace, but not social justice. In other words, it can be skewed to prioritize silence and the veneer of unity, rather than actually addressing harm and abuse, which may sometimes entail exile. Restorative justice can also suffer from limited resources, as it requires trained facilitators and time that may not be accessible, especially when there's high demand. And of course, there's also the potential for reoffending. These criticisms are not unique to restorative justice, but at the very least, restorative justice offers a more humane approach to addressing harm and promoting healing, particularly in cases where traditional justice systems have failed to provide meaningful solutions. Another alternative that frequently presents itself is transformative justice. It is sometimes confused with restorative justice or treated as just another synonym of the same concept, but they differ in their focus, scope, process, values, and much more. I think one of the major differences between them is that restorative justice tends to be incorporated within the existing justice system, including pre-trial, post-conviction, and even after an offender has served their sentence whereas transformative justice seeks to create alternative systems and structures that are not reliant on the state or the criminal justice system. Transformative justice is an approach to addressing harm that seeks to transform the conditions that contribute to harm in the first place, rather than solely focusing on punishment or repairing harm after it has occurred. It is a systemic approach rather than solely situational, and it is built on the bedrock of community, because when people feel a strong sense of connection to their community, they're more likely to behave in ways that are consistent with community values and norms, which can create a sense of social harmony that is essential for building trust, promoting cooperation, and resolving conflicts peacefully. However, when this social harmony is disrupted by harm, it's usually a sign that there are underlying issues within the community that need to be identified and addressed. Root causes of harm may include simply not understanding that a particular action is harmful, or our basic needs, physical or mental, are not being met, or we have internalized an oppressive system such as patriarchy, or a power imbalance has not been addressed, or we are upholding a toxic cultural norm, or we are lashing out as a result of our own unaddressed pain. Punishment does not solve these causes. In fact, because punishment can only occur when the punisher possesses more power than the punished, the act of punishment is determined by the individual or group with the power to administer it, not necessarily by what is just. 
which is why we can see that our current justice system does not punish many of the world's worst people. It punishes those who lack the power to evade punishment. It perpetuates existing power imbalances and creates new ones, leading to greater harm. Transformative justice seeks to acknowledge the interconnectedness of individual and systemic forms of harm. It recognizes that addressing harm requires a holistic and intersectional approach that considers the unique experiences and needs of those who are most impacted. This approach is based on three core principles, note the order, protecting the victim and providing them with the space to heal, noting of course that a simple victim-actor binary may not always exist, protecting the community and providing it with the space to heal, including realizing how the community shortcomings may have contributed to this harm, and working collaboratively with the harmful actor to identify what is necessary to prevent further harm, including recognition, accountability, and unlearning. Transformative justice is not easy work, especially when we are used to punitive forms of justice. However, it is far more comprehensive as it recognizes that sometimes our society needs changing for the better in order to help an individual change for the better. Still, transformative justice should not be applied uncritically and without proper consideration of alternatives, as doing so can divert attention from a collective's efforts, delegitimize direct action by survivors, and impose significant burdens on people's time and energy. The extended periods of uncertainty that the process can take may be exhausting for the community and even endangering for the victim in question, but rushing the process to maintain social harmony doesn't work either. The agency of the victim in question should be paramount, but it can be difficult to both engage with the harmful actor and address the victim's needs. This can be complicated by factors such as favoritism, popularity, privilege, marginalized identity, and the sometimes blurred lines between victim-actor binaries and mutual harm. We have to try to avoid oversimplifying complex situations. Not to mention, though false accusations may be uncommon, that doesn't mean they don't happen. In dealing with communities, there may also be some stubbornness to change cultural norms that consistently create new harm. But if a community is unwilling to challenge some of its traditional values or practices, such as corporal punishment, how can it expect an end to cycles of violence? During the process of social revolution, some lines need to be drawn between perpetrators that a community wants to spend time and energy on and those they don't, because change in individual behavior requires significant time, skills, and resources. There are some factors that can help a community or collective decide whether they want to pursue reconciliation or expulsion. For reconciliation, factors may include the accuser's desire for reconciliation, the group's affection for the accused, the harm inflicted being rather minor, the harm caused unintentionally or due to ignorance, the accused themselves being a survivor of relevant abuse, the accused denying the allegation and being believed, and the accused expressing remorse. Conversely, for expulsion, factors may include the accuser's request for the accused to depart, a lack of affinity with the accused by the group, serious harm done, a pattern of abuse, the accused being unresponsive to dialogue, the accused appearing to be aware of boundary violations, the accused denying the allegations for being disbelieved, and the accused showing no genuine remorse. Which brings us to the concept of bad people that gets brought up so frequently in these sorts of discussions. I think people are generally able to accept that rehabilitation, mediation, restoration, and transformation are all potentially effective avenues for dealing with the many causes of harm and conflict between people. But at the same time, there is also this pervasive sense that it can work for everybody. Maybe some people are just irredeemable. Maybe there's some percentage, however small, of truly bad people. This may be a controversial stance to take, one rife with philosophical turmoil, but I'm willing to concede for the sake of argument that there may be truly irreparable evils on this earth. Those who manipulate, dominate, and expertly navigate the games of power. There may be individuals who are simply bad whose behavior may be reinforced by social structures, but not entirely explained away by social structures. What then? 
even if such people deserve to die, I wouldn't entrust any court of law with the responsibility of determining that. I don't believe any state can protect us from such people for the simple reason that such bad people will inevitably seek to scale to positions of power within that state. The solution to dealing with these bad people is not through creating positions of power, but through removing them, making it impossible for anyone to seize or maintain control over other people. There may always be people who will selfishly fight to create and maintain hierarchies, but the anarchist struggle is continuously organized to dismantle every relationship of control that might develop as we strive toward anarchy. Today, I sought to put justice on trial. I sought to redefine our understanding of crime and explore potential alternatives in how we might respond to it. I still don't have the answers. I still have a completely crystal clear vision of a just justice system. Justice, as it turns out, is complicated. A lot more complicated than locking people up and throwing away the key. There will never be a one-stop shop for justice. There will never be a system free of pain or distress. Despite knowing it won't solve anything, my instincts might still demand revenge if I were victimized. I don't know what's best, but what I do know is that we need a form of justice that creates lasting change for the better. We need a form of justice that continuously creates a community that is better capable of preventing harm in the first place and responding to harm when it occurs. I said my piece for now, but I'd like to maintain an open mind. I hope you'll do the same. All power to all the people. Peace. I want to take a chance to shout out Ola Renati, a movement lawyer and political commentator who's doing some excellent work exploring various issues related to abolition and social justice on her channel. Be sure to check out her videos linked in the description below. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe and share with your fellow people. Thanks once again of course to the family, including our newest members, Dalen Towns, Tess Lash Tail, Sophia Rune, Hirondo and Stephen. Join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash saintrue. Check out all my other videos for a range of radical topics. Follow me on Twitter at underscore saintrue. Thanks again. Peace.